Hey, what's up? I'm Pascal from Orange Pixel. Welcome to another video. I have not been doing a lot of things because I had other stuff on my mind, but I figured I could give you a little update on my web project, my, my project web, my, my HTML5 games and the whole framework and engine that I need to create those games. So let's talk about that after the intro. So I talked about my HTML5 game project or what I'm planning to do with that, trying to get games on uh, sites like Pokey or Crazy Games. And for that, I need to actually have games running in HTML5. Now I already had a couple of older games, Gunslut 1 and 2, they are running. Um, minor bugs that I haven't looked at yet, but we're talking like really minor stuff. So if you play Gunslut 1 on your phone and the, you pause it, there will be like um, saying press X to play or continue. Of course you can't press X, you just have to touch it and the touch works. It's just that that label needs changing. I could do it right now in like two minutes, but it's one of those things. I think it's just a mindset thingy and I have been working on so many other things and projects all over the place. I haven't done that. I should do that very soon. So instead of uploading those games to websites, I've been actually building up my whole new framework, Game Engine, which is like a copy of my uh, PC version, the one I use for my Steam games, mobile games, uh, that we also use for the Switch version, uh, but that will not run on HTML5. So I needed to pretty much create a version in JavaScript that does exactly the same thing. And uh, preferably everything is named the same as well so that I know what's happening and I can easily, easily copy games over from the PC version to the web version. Um, that's not the plan because those are very different games, but it should be possible and I should have all the options available to me in this game engine. Now, a lot of people commented on other videos and right now there's somebody already typing, hold on, hang on, I know. There's Unity, there's Unreal, there's Game Maker, LibGDX, many others. Uh, there's Phaser, actually a HTML5 game engine. There are very many options out there, but I find it very saddening that so many people just expect a tool like that to be the solution to everything. Especially when it comes to web games, you want these games to be tiny and packages and small. And most of these tools, except Phaser, will create an output that's much bigger than it has to be. There will be much more stuff going on behind the code you don't see, uh, that you don't need. It can be done so much smaller and faster and specific to my working methods and that's the real thing um, all these engines have some sort of a game scene you can add objects to it and then you can add methods and properties to those objects and that's all great and fine and nice but there's a lot of code happening underneath that a lot of i guess younger game developers that got started in this have no clue of what's happening and that's a lot of times there's stuff happening you don't need in your game or there's very little happening that could easily be done in a different way. So I like to create my own framework because it allows me to keep creating games in my workflow and my work methods. And that allows me to create games much faster, much smaller, and actually fully understand what's going on in the code. So for that, I needed to build a couple of things and I did all this in a week. You don't need a game engine if you know what you're doing. And it's also a lot of fun figuring these things out. That's pretty much what programming is. Um, and I think we're getting a little divide of people that just want to create games. And then there is a lot of people who still like the code, but they should be digging more into the code and not just drop in a physics engine and watch stuff happen on screen because you have no idea how many processor time all those little particles are taken up. And it could probably be done more optimized because these tools and these libraries are built for a generic um, workflow. They are there to make most options possible, but you often only need one of those options, so you don't need everything else that these engines or tools do. But that's a battle I'm not gonna win, I guess, these days. So let's just talk about the stuff I actually managed to get up and running. The first thing I had to get up and running is a WebGL, which pretty much means uh, rendering stuff to the graphics card and not rendering it from software, which a normal HTML5 canvas thingies render it software-wise, and that's a lot slower. Rendering it using WebGL, you get to actually talk to the graphics processor 
it does its thing, what it's good at. So you can render stuff on screen a lot faster. Now most games on PC and on mobile and I think on console as well, they will use something like OpenGL, which is the big brother version of a WebGL, which is a, it has most of the options, just not all of them. Now Gunsludge 1 and 2 run in canvas. They run smooth as butter, 60 frames per second. But if I want to create bigger stuff, if for some reason I want to create a web version of Gauntlet of Power or Ray Legacy City, I need a lot more power than Canvas will supply. So I had to create this. Also, if I'm ever going to do third party work for other companies, they will prefer this method because it can do a lot more in higher resolutions. So I had to have this up and running. Now it was very easy to get it up and running for the PC version, but on mobile I ran into many issues. Now most of those issues were created by just not understanding how a browser on a phone talks to the graphic card. So I was pushing data constantly and I had to just first pack it up and push it at once, which kind of removed all the issues I was running into, but that took me a couple of days work. I could have done all this in half a week. That means that everything I write will run on PC, run on your phone's browser, it will probably run on your TV's browser, your Switch, everything that has a web browser, a modern web browser will run these games. That's another cool thing. Now once that was up and running, there's only one thing you really need for two-dimensional games, a sprite batch. Now sprites are all the tiny images you see, enemies being animated, main player, coins, uh, status bar thingies, everything is a sprite. It's pretty much a rectangular image shown somewhere on the screen. You can show one and another one and another one and we'll have like maybe a thousand, two thousand, every 60 frames per second. That's a lot of images that need to be moved around and shown. And uh, when you have a sprite batch, you can actually um, get all the information for all these images as like one big package. You dump it on the, onto the graphic card and it will handle it and dump it onto the screen in one call. While it does that, like in milliseconds, you can already run new code for the next frame and that pace you get 60 frames per second. Now these images can be rotated, they can be resized, they can be recolored, flipped horizontally, flipped vertically, anything can be done to them and it doesn't cost any extra processing power. So a sprite batch is just very important to render a lot of fast arcade of action games. I had to have that as well. I think it got it up and running, but I based it on other people's open source code and then stripped it completely apart. And then I had to make sure it did all the things I wanted to do. Now, the third thing I needed was a, a frame buffer, which is like, like a, a transparent piece of paper. You put it on your screen, you draw stuff on it, and then you can put another frame on there, also see-through. You put other items on there and then it kind of stamps that onto your display uh, when you're done. Why would you do it like that? For a couple of reasons. Uh, my light source rendering, it needs a different, uh, like a different sheet of paper that actually blends whatever is behind it. So you need a frame buffer for that. Um, also, the frame buffers can be different sizes. So my games run in low resolution, but I can draw on a frame buffer that's a little higher resolution and it will all be stamped onto the full screen resolution. So usually in my games, the status bar is running at, I don't know, uh, 240 pixels high or maybe 320, uh, which also is where the font rendering is happening so that fonts are more crisp. And then the game resolution itself can be anything between 160 pixels high. So that's a lot, a lot bigger pixels. But both of those frame buffers are then rendered into the full resolution of your monitor. And it will actually uh, work out magically. I hope I'm making this uh, stuff clear because I'm very excited about these things. It's very interesting. And I hope more people will dig into these things and figure out what's happening underneath all these Unity and Unreal engines. And they are doing 3D, which is more complicated. You can do a lot and learn a lot from two dimensional things as well. And building those engines these days is easy because all the information is out there. Now, the final piece of this puzzle for me was uh, rendering fonts. This isn't a requirement because you can use Photoshop or GIMP and just uh, draw the text you want. And then that's a sprite image, put it on the screen. But that's not very dynamic if your text ever changes you need to change the images. Or if you want to add localization and translation, you need to create a whole bunch of images and it's a lot easier to type text and then have that magically appear on screen. 
Now this is again something I got very sad about. There are a bunch of articles out there talking you through how to do text rendering in HTML5. There are many different ways. For me, I needed a version that uses true type fonts uh, and renders those out as a bitmap or whatever option is available. Uh, because my other games do that as well, I have those fonts already so I can use that same font and render it the same way. <sighs> The problem is that these articles talk about the options that are available, but when it comes to implementing code that actually does it, they all refer to existing libraries. And um, those libraries are not just font rendering, they come with a bunch of other things that I don't need. I just want to render a font onto the screen. I thought it was pretty easy, but all these articles made it seem impossible to do because all these libraries had to be downloaded and then you have to install tools to actually download those libraries because you can't just download a zip file with the source code. You have to go through all these installation thingies. I had to find an easier way. It took me 30 minutes to get it up and running. It's not as hard as people made it seem. Now there is a tool out there that will take a true type font. You will select uh, which character sets you want. So that's like Cyrillic, uh, Latin, which characters will be dumped into a bitmap file, a PNG, just a, a simple image that will then contain all these characters. It will also dump out a data file telling you where each character starts, how big it is, um, the height of each character, all those things. You just have to load that data, then you know where the images are. It's a texture atlas with all these letters and, and numbers and characters. Just draw it on the screen. It literally took me 30 minutes to get that up and running. Now, I don't know why these articles all point you towards libraries and other functions. I understand that's easier, but that's not telling you how it's done. And that's where what makes me very sad and I think we're losing a lot of knowledge because we're making things too easy for, for ourselves. And duh. yeah, that's probably my age talking, but I hope that somewhere, someone younger than me is actually interested in, in creating engines because at some point, the people who make all these tools and engines and figure out these things will not be around anymore. Then who's gonna fix it? All right, ranting is over, let's move on. So I'm now at the point where I'm Porting my utility type uh, tools and thingies, um, handling interface button placements, a dialogue rendering, just all the stuff I kind of need in all my games or I'm used to having in all my games and that I use in all my games to make certain things very quickly and easy to be done. Um, and then I have almost all of it. I'll need to handle game pads. That's now an option in web games. I haven't fully figured out how yet. I'm sure I'll figure it out. Then I have everything ready to build games. Now the planning for this is that I'm gonna do these things um, end of the year maybe or early 2025. So I'll have this framework up and running before then. Most of it is now done and I can, um, I might actually as a test port one of my games like Snake Core, maybe Gauntlet of Power, port it over to uh, JavaScript just on this new framework. I think it's gonna work and run. Um, we'll see. I also have to push Gunslux 1 and 2 to these websites and see if there's actually money to be made because that's the whole thing here. I want to try and make money from web games somehow. I think there's a lot of potential there. I'm almost there. I've been spending just a week on all of that and now in between normal tasks, I'm uh, grabbing some code from Java for my normal version, porting it off, copy and pasting it in the JavaScript version and then fixing what, what's broken and uh, see if it runs, take another code and another piece of code and until that's all done, then we're ready to go, which is still very exciting. Now only last week, I think Discord announced their activities now being open to all developers. That's another very interesting thing because developers can create a game um, playable by multiple people on a Discord channel and they can have in-app payments to get money actually from these games and not just give it away for free, which is very interesting potential because we're talking about millions and millions of users each month on Discord. If you can have people in your Discord play the game, tell other people about the game, they might get involved with your Discord or they might want that game for their Discord and it spreads out 
pretty quickly, I think. I think there's a lot of potential there besides all the game websites are already there. Uh, YouTube Games is doing something, coming out with something. There's just a lot of potential for web games and, and being able to do almost everything that I do in my PC games and my console games. This should be interesting and fun. Now there's another potential for me on this one educating people and doing tutorials. I had a lot of questions over the years from people asking if I could do tutorials and things like that uh, for Java, LibGDX. I don't think it makes sense to tell people uh, how to install all the things you need for it and how to make it run. But for web games, all you need is a text editor and a browser. And you already have that installed on your device already, most likely. So, um, I could potentially do some tutorials or lessons or whatever uh, when I'm more settled in with this stuff. Um, I'm not sure yet. Let me know if there would be any interest in that. And I might actually give out my framework once it's done and wrapped up. Um, it's not a trade secret or something special, but it's usable to create fun games with. And it could be interesting to see how what people do with it. All right, um, sorry for the rambly type of video. Like I said, not a lot done last week. Had a bunch of other things, um, not a lot on the planning for this week as well. I might take a little, a couple of days off. So I uh, figured this was a good and interesting topic. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. <sighs> Hop on the Discord, come say hi, and I will see you next week. Bye.